I'm so over myself, like, that on the weekends, I'm, I, I don't want to do anything with myself. <laughs> I try to live a life that has nothing to do with the life I live, or I'm supposed to live, you know what I mean? Like fashion. Party and dinners and this and that, and no, I'm not into that. Three o'clock, Philip Lim reads my iCal meeting notification. I chuckle to myself. I didn't plan it this way, but I can appreciate the clever yet subtle parallel that comes to mind between our meeting time and his eponymous fashion label, 3-1, Philip Lim. It's May in New York, and it's my final Sunday in the city after a long and fairly hectic week. I drop a text to my photographer friend, Carmen Chan, whose voice you're gonna hear occasionally in this audio story. And I let her know that I'm heading down Broom Street towards Soho, where we've scheduled an interview and an impromptu photo shoot with Philip Lim at his apartment. As we step out of the elevator, Philip gives us a warm and inviting welcome. And as we enter the space, for a second, my mind wanders to that scene from the movie Big, when Tom Hanks invites Elizabeth Perkins over to his Manhattan apartment. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You uh, want soda? That's not to say that Philip's interior design style is like Hank's character in that movie, but I get the same childlike excitement walking into his world at that moment. Casual and relaxed, Lim is dressed more like he's expecting two close friends over for brunch than a pair of strangers for an interview. And in place of a bustling atelier or a hectic design studio, there's stillness. It's quiet, save for the distant sounds of Soho below, trickling through a series of large windows that are currently filled with the kind of direct sunlight that a photographer only dreams of. A comfortable living room is the substitute for a sterile conference room. Artwork and nostalgic objects that Lim has collected over the years take the place of marketing representatives and PR people. It's just the three of us. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let me see what I have. As you'll hear periodically in the audio, I had some minor recording issues. You may hear some static pops from time to time, but some of the sound bites from Philip were too good to cut. As I quickly begin to mic Lim up with one of our in the field lav mics, he opens up a bottle of red wine, and with no rigid set of questions or an interview outline, our conversation begins. It's a lot of sacrifice. I had to give up a lot of things and do things that I remind myself it's for a long, uh, it's for long term. I've, I've begun to actually like remove myself from public space, like public, like a lot of interviews, this and that, this and that, because I know that adds up to more expectations, more feeding into this, this hype, you know what I mean? And, and forgetting that actually the product is the star. What you do is a star, you're not the star. I started, I, I designed clothes because I just love to make things. It was always behind the scenes. But now the designer is actually in front of a camera. It's a brand, it's all these, it's a promise, it's all these things and it's really like, huh? I didn't sign up for that, you know what I mean? So slowly, I've been kind of just picking and choosing more what I want to do, who I want to speak to, taking control of my own, my own actions, you know what I mean? And not letting it be up to my press team or the business and this and that. And 
there's a lot of stack rest because you know at the same time it, you know when you're in a spotlight and then you like are taken away you're like oh what's wrong with me but it's actually if it's your choice then it's okay the day of our interview is Philip's last day of a month-long hiatus that he took off of work. The following day, Monday, was to be his first day back in the studio after taking personal time off to reset and recalibrate. No emails, no remote conferencing, proper time off. Back to the grind, but, you know, I'm starting the day half day, easing my way in, and um, really just... Again, trying to um, do what I say, you know, about kind of controlling and staging my own path and fate and, and getting back into... Uh, my goal is to get back into work in a way that I want to work, not I have to work, you know what I mean? Because that's not going to be successful or fruitful for anybody. And do you have support inside the company for that, I guess, movement or those pivots to sort of happen? No, I mean, they have a choice. They don't have a choice. <laughs> 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 to get, like, accept it or, or do without it. Introspection was on the agenda today, not press jargon. Life lessons and creativity and personal growth were the topics, not cut and sew details and go to market speak. All kidding aside, it's like, I'm super fortunate to be around amazing people. They see when I'm happy, they see when I'm unhappy, and I'm not unhappy for no reason. It's really just, it's insane. It's not humane, you know what I mean? Our interview was taking place on the tail end of a very long stint of travel for myself. In the process of building Macon, launching new stories, and just generally figuring out how to be a business owner for the first time, I began to open up to Philip about struggling to balance my own creative passions with the demands and responsibilities of building a creative business. It will kill you. Like I, I have that issue now where I'm just in meetings, meetings, meetings. I recently took a month off and that's like, people are like, what? Let you quit? Are you, are you okay? I'm like, no, I had to. I had to recalibrate and I had to go back and think about how I need to balance meetings versus making shit because that's my therapy. You know, I was kind of going insane because I was in meetings only and I wasn't able to do my thing, have my therapy. Let me take a step back for a moment and offer some background on Philip Lim for those who might not know his full story. Born in Thailand of Chinese and Cambodian descent, but raised in Southern California, Philip Lim is arguably one of the most critically and commercially successful independent designers of our era. Lim co-founded his first label that was called Development in 2000 until 2004. Following this, he went on to co-found 3-1 Philip Lim in 2005, a moniker that gave nod to Lim's age when he started the label with friend and business partner Wen Zhou. While it's impossible to summarize fashion's transition from the streets to the runway and vice versa into a 30-second soundbite, it is important to mention Philip Lim's place within the context of an industry that has drastically changed over the last decade and a half. Philip, welcome to Hong Kong. It's great to have you. Just five years ago, Philip Lim's award-winning designs are now not only a staple. Love how Philip brings his own personal style to his collection, not only Philip for men but also The 3.1 Philip Lim mini parsley, 400 stores worldwide. I sound so old, but when <laughs> we started, I mean, you literally had to learn everything by yourself because there was no sharing of um, visuals. So you just had to imagine it, and you had to just like literally. If you wanted a certain song, you'd have to really go find it. It wasn't instant. If you wanted to dress a certain way, you had to go through all the trials and tribulations of like the scavenger hunt. If you wanted a certain mood, you had to like have the experience of it. Now you don't have to. 3-1 Philip Lim arrived at a time when the lines between streetwear and high fashion were beginning to blur together. 
In an era when cities like New York, Milan, and Paris were holding the keys to the runway, the Internet of Things began to change the face of contemporary fashion as we know it today. Philip Lim and other Asian American designers at that time were at the forefront of bridging a divide that previously alienated certain subcultures from being included. The early 2000s represented a time and place when social media was democratizing and expediting access to things like inspiration and audience, as well as cultural understanding and knowledge. It was during this period that Philip Lim would call the inspiration from music, skate culture, and design into an entirely fresh and new take on the world of fashion. I grew up in Huntington Beach. I literally grew up during the time of like skate and surf. Yeah. <laughs> it was literally like what you would expect, just nothing, except for surf and skate maybe, you know what I mean? But it was the early beginnings of um, MTV. So you would start to see what you heard. You'd start to see them form in physical form, meaning people. Like everything was self-styled. So the people who sang, the, made the music looked like the songs. Now you can't tell. I was fortunate enough to like really, we just had to make it up. And everyone looks so different, but then somehow they match the music. I think it kind of goes back to like, there was a storyline. Lim's upbringing on the West Coast is something that he does admit influences his work style and his approach to design. But at the same time, there's an inherent curiosity that naturally propelled him beyond the confines of Huntington Beach and pushed him to move to New York. And it was this move to New York that propelled his point of view and identity forward into something that would go on to define his career. It's a journey. It's, um... It's where I come from, but at the same time, it's my curiosity. I think I think the one thing that people always say, you know, there's always a, a, a very laid back attitude in what you do. And it comes from living on that side of the coast. I remember when I first moved to New York, I was wearing like, um, God, everyone was in black. I was in like African dashikis and vintage Levi's and like Birkenstocks or like mustard color. Cuban boots and people are like what the hell but it was that California thing you know what I mean that I um, always brought with me you know even like Uggs I, I used to wear Uggs because it was so cold here and I was like you know it's like hey you know I used to wear Uggs with like a beautiful old helmet length camel coat and just like big giant Levi's 501s you know what I mean just very simple but it was very California I was curious about Lim's upbringing, the roots of California culture, and how it influenced his modern outlook. But in the interest of time, it felt more fitting to parlay the topic of his interaction with culture back then and compare it to the culture experiences of 2017. And at the risk of a leading question, I was curious if it was even possible as a young person entering the industry today to garner the same inspiration and originality nowadays. If it was me, I would have the 2017 version of it. Actually, I work with them. My design team is very young, some of them. You know, they're very talented, but they also grew up in a very instant product of uh, community sharing references. But if I say something uh, past, like, the 80s, they don't know what it is because they never had to really go after it. They never had to dig. If I even say, like, the 40s, they're like, huh? No. I'm like, yeah, 40s. But, you know, even if you went to go and you dug for the 40s, you might find a lot of things along the way, like the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, that you're like, wow, I like this, I like this, and then you start to build it your own language right, by picking things, you know what I mean? So it's not even about going to the 40s for inspiration. It's about taking that journey. And along the way, you pick up things that you relate to. And then in the end, you come back and you're like, wow, I have a, my own language. Now you don't have to do that because everything is instant. And the problem is, I think, algorithms. 
But Lim also holds a surprisingly refreshing outlook on the next generation of young designers coming up. There is a role and responsibility of established designers in the industry to push and sharpen the next generation of creatives, not chastise them or stand in opposition to their way of thinking. Part of this mentoring process involves embracing new technology and the new tools of design. But it's still important to take a deeper dive into the sources of inspiration and experiences beyond what sits behind the pixels of your computer or phone. And they're like, you're like a tiger dad. <laughs> I'm like, exactly, not good enough. <laughs> um, and I'm like, back to it, you know what I mean? Not good enough. They're like, but this is good. I'm like, your research has, has it only goes to the 80s. I don't want the 80s. I grew up in the 80s. Go further. And they're like, where? <laughs> I know. No, you know what? Um, yeah, I always like, you know, leave, 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 go have, go have experiences, go do things, blah, blah. Nowadays too, everyone's a designer, right? And you know, everyone has a right to be a designer or whatever, but you don't, you truly, I don't think you can truly call yourself that until you really know how to actually make something because you have to respect like the whole process of it. You know, it's not just, I have a good idea. This strikes a chord my mind wanders to some of the best and brightest ideas of our time. This is the Tesla Model S. And Congrats. just like my... We are well. celebrating our 50th anniversary and naming Pharrell as our distinguished artist in residence for the I year. I just take my finger and I scroll. That's it. Everyone has ideas. But there is a responsibility to pair great ideas with great rigidity to bring those ideas to life in a meaningful and a sustainable way. At the risk of painting it with too broad a stroke, this is where the line between the prototypical starving artist and the business of creativity begins to take shape. So what are you going to do about it? And how are you going to begin this idea? And what if something changes? Does this idea change? Do you know how to change with the idea? You know, do you know how to do you know how to like follow this idea till, you know, it it actually gets to a point where it's real? It's a very interesting process in the company. It's like becomes a finishing school and then they get beat up a little bit. At the end of the day, the ones that survive, they're like, yeah, you know, you're right. Actually, it's more fun to actually make things. This is the part in the story that the path between a personal point of view on fashion, culture, and identity in his early days collided with the journey of parlaying his ideas into what would ultimately become 3-1 Philip Lim. Uh, that's the evolution. That's the natural evolution of an idea to a business. Business affords creativity and creativity creates business. Every idea you have is a potential business. But if you don't run that business, it's just an idea. You really, really need both. It was so unpopular when um, I used to say that because um, they were like, oh, it's commercial, but no, I don't. It's, it's communication. Who do you want to communicate to? One person or 100? 100 or 1,000? And you can do it in a very creative manner. You know, now it's, um, what's your happiness in it all? Do you want to be a big commercial success or you want to be, because there's always a trade-off, but from there, you have the power to structure that business how you want to. You could easily coast and like just go give in to what people expect you to do, which is be in meetings. Or else you could say, nope, I'm only be in these types of meetings. I only will be in meetings this many hours a day, only these days. Mm -hmm. And the rest, I'm doing my shit. In the pursuit of doing what you love and loving what you're doing, it's so easy to get caught up in the motions of being creative as a job title. The expectations around creating things in the context of an organization are drastically different from making things as an individual. How are you supposed to maintain personal and professional growth as a creative in industry while insulating yourself from things like groupthink or from the daily grind and the expectations that can so easily derail talent and potential? <laughs> 
For Lim, his recent hiatus was necessary. It was imperative. It was an intentional separation and detachment from the templatized version of how a designer should and shouldn't be. It was an effort in recalibrating his own priorities for the betterment of himself, his namesake brand, and his business. It's so easy to write off the decision as selfish, or maybe entitled or elitist. Sure, must be nice, just take a month off and go off the grid, must be nice. But Lim sees a lack of responsibility on the part of many like him in striking the balance between what is good for an individual in his position and what is mutually beneficial for their brand, business, and team. It caused a big, massive confusion because what you have to be really careful about is, is not to betray what you love. I love to design. I just, I've always, I love it. I love it to this day still. But it kind of gets convoluted in days of meetings about design. That's not what I love. I don't love to talk design. I don't love to talk shop. I love to actually get into the shop you know, and produce things. And it became where, oh my God, is this design? Is this design? I, I don't like design anymore. I don't want to be a designer anymore because I'm in meetings all day. It's just the actual life of it. But it's not. It's just really the business aspect of being in a, des in a design business. But you have to catch that and separate it. And hopefully you f you f you're able to structure it so that you know that that's just an aspect of the business of design. You don't actually hate design. Yeah, you don't actually hate design. You love design. You just don't like that being consumed by the business aspect of it. We begin to riff back and forth about the early days of building 3-1, with me chiming in on my own experiences of building Macon and launching a startup. You are lucky in the fact that you're beginning it. I'm going kind of backwards, meaning like now I had to go back and figure out how to, how to um, remember what was important to me and now how to structure it going forward. So for me to achieve this personally for growth, I need these types of people around me. Make that plan and make that list of people and then check it off when the time is right. That way, they got you covered. But if you don't have that plan and you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, it's gonna be a prison. When we built the business, I didn't think about those things. I thought about just, this is amazing, this is fun, la la la, you know what I mean? And it's still very fun. It's, you just have to literally think about it now, what it takes for, for you to have your freedom to do your thing, to grow personally and professionally. You know, what's important to you? Is freedom? Is it money? Is it uh, creativity? This was incredibly refreshing to hear. It's rare to have a person in Lim's position open up candidly about the balance between personal satisfaction and happiness within the context of responsible business leadership. And as a young creative, it can be so easy to miss the full scope and magnitude of running a business, to forget the countless hours behind the scenes that go into creating a lasting company and a lasting brand. It's equal parts creativity and ideas meets rigor, discipline, and humility. You miss the trials and tribulations of actual work. In that actual trial and tribulations, you actually learn how to run a business. You actually learn from the mistakes. You actually learn how to adjust. You learn how to maneuver. A lot of young creatives miss the full story. If you're like me, you've become so accustomed to seeing a window into someone's hard work via a one to two second thumb flick through your feed, it's so easy to see the highlight reel and the instant fame, but miss the trials and the tribulations of actual work, the grind, the work that goes into building the highlight reel. So what's the balance of the creative and the business side? 
it's hard to get used to the idea of more, more, more when, when in fact your instinct is tell you, is telling you less, less, less. If I were in the business of one person, no problem. But unfortunately, I have different responsibilities now. But at the same time, I'm what I am. You know what I mean? I'm part. I'm a part of a business. The true balance now and the true goal for me now is to how to balance the business part but at the same time still continue to find what keeps me going, find my spot within the business. As our conversation begins to transition from introspection on the personal versus professional tip, the topic naturally spills over into how business and creativity play into the changing face of fashion. This sense of immediacy and the more, more, more mentality is nothing new to the fashion industry. It's already had drastic effects on the fashion landscape and how the industry approaches design present day in four simple words. See now, buy now. It's really uh, buy now, wear now. Uh, it's really disruptive and breakthrough in the fashion industry. Some people And I would see something and I'd see it off the runway and want it right now. Well, I'm not going to wear, you know, in the heat of the summer, you know, a shilling coat. Right. You know, we'd go traveling around on the waters and see all the... A constant throughout our interview has been Lim's lighthearted energy. He's an incredibly casual and welcoming person to be around, the type of person you meet and it immediately feels like you've known each other for years. And as he opens up about the real work ethic required in building anything of substance, you can feel a slight shift. There's a deep conviction in the subtle mannerisms of his body language and tone, or the intonation as he talks about some of the trends impacting his industry. The problem is, is like, you can't continue to spoil people. That didn't never work. It's almost like if you had kids, would you see now? You want it now? No. Would you do that to them? Absolutely no. And why would you do it to, why would you do it in any aspect, period? It's the biggest equation for disaster. What part of life is good when you can have anything you want, anytime you want? Lim's perspective on the current trend within the fashion industry is by no means uncommon. And the fashion industry continues to fumble and navigate its way through challenges like maintaining relevance and still growing the bottom line for shareholders. And while the see now, buy now trend has lost some momentum, the industry is still fumbling its way through that culture versus commerce juxtaposition. When does fast fashion become too fast? How do established fashion houses or independent designers like Lim and many others know where to adapt versus when to maintain course? Also, it kind of makes you wonder who's actually winning or losing from a fashion world with so much immediate conspicuous consumption. Are the customers the ones who are demanding the ability to buy straight off the runway? Are the consumers demanding a higher frequency of designs than the traditional spring, summer, and fall, winter cadence? It's a group of genius marketers who didn't really have to pick up the pieces, who really didn't have to figure it out. It's like, we're gonna do this and you guys figure it out. And the problem is it really, it really rocked the whole industry. And I think that it's not sustainable. Even if it did work, I would hate to think that that's what we did because you know what people don't think about is like sure you see this and you get it now your immediate gratification but you know who's really paying the price it's the workers it's the natural resources you can't just tell a tree to grow like that you can't tell like lamb to once you shave their wool off the sheep you, they grow right away where are you getting all this from and you know that thing that you want clothes to be turned around like in a couple days? You know the, the seamstresses that work in these factories that, you know, are so um, ethical? Guess what? It's all out the window. Someone's paying your price, you know what I mean? Like, get a grip here. Think about it. There's a cost to everything. And the problem is we don't really want to hear that, but we should because that's how you participate. The goal of our conversation was never to get hung up on criticizing the fashion industry, 
But given Lim's personal recalibration of his priorities and the desire to balance his vision for his label with his own personal ambitions, the state of the fashion industry was an inevitable topic. It has a crucial role if it can save itself. Fashion's in trouble right now. I don't think fashion is so fashionable in that sense of what it, what it really means. I think it's very fashionable, fashion, right now. It's very popular. And everyone has a fashion line, and everyone has a this, and everyone, it's almost like a, the pop equation, right? It's like a pop star equation. But the real purpose of fashion, I wonder um, if we could ever get back to the beauty of difference. And not difference as in like, look at my skin color, I'm different, or look at my, I like this type of music or that type of music, just like through fashion as a form of a self-identifier. You know what I mean? Because everyone looks the same now. You know what I mean? And it's because, again, it's an algorithm. If the traditional role of fashion was to serve as a cultural identifier, a nod to one's personal identity, then what is its role present day? It's, it's truly like a self-identifier. It was your badge. This is me, not this is us. I don't think anyone wants the challenge of looking different. People are now plowed to look the same. But maybe it's just a phase right now. If you're like me, you're often grappling with figuring out what things are fleeting phases or trends versus what are legitimate shifts that are a sign of changing times. You obviously don't want to be behind on the trend or end up one of those old heads that's just constantly discrediting change in general. But nowadays, how do you know what's lasting versus what's fleeting? The cycles are so much faster these days than they ever were before, even just five years ago. It's on steroids, you know what I mean? And it's like, I'm so embarrassed to be in an industry that think that that's okay. That's why, you know, my, my personal gut instinct is to scale down, to recalibrate and be more profound with your choices that you make and make it more meaningful. Put more love into it, put more thought into it, put more purpose into it. That's where I want to focus my creative output. And I think that that might be the most horrible business decision, but you know what? I. I I need to be able to live with myself too. The idea of myself as a person is the biggest business. It's close to 6 p.m. now. The rays of sun that were once silhouetting Lim from behind his living room couch are being gradually replaced by the reflection of streetlights from Broom Street below. A now empty bottle of red wine sits on Lim's Eve Klein blue cocktail table, each glass a chapter of our conversation today. And as we begin to wrap, with Lim still mic'd up to the lapel that hangs from his collar, I ask him if he has any parting thoughts. I think it's very important to surround yourself with people you admire, respect, have a kinship to. It's a company you keep, you know, it's a cliche, but it's such a relevant uh, forever cliche, you know what I mean? That quality about caring about something, no matter what it is, is very important to me. You shouldn't care if people, what people think about you, but you should actually care how you affect people. 